Life as her mother isn't about fixing her because she is already perfect. I am a much more confident advocate. I've become a better person. I now have the ability to push through so that I can be the best version of myself. I'm just so blessed to have learned all I have from her. Hey, you're listening to The Rare Life. I'm your host, Madeline Cheney. I am so excited to celebrate Rare Disease Day with you through this special episode. Some of you may remember that for last year's Rare Disease Day, we featured 12 parents sharing their stories in three minutes. So it was a bit of a lightning round. Well, this year I want to change things up a bit. I really want this episode to be a celebration of our children and the things that we've gained through our journeys with them. I've asked five parents to share a bit about what they love about their child and how they've changed because of them. So as you're listening, you'll probably notice there's a lot of awesome variety between the parents and their experiences, and there are also some cool recurring themes. And as they share, I encourage you to reflect on both the struggles that you've faced alongside your child, as well as what you have gained along the way, and how lucky we are to be their parents. All right, first up, we have parent Lexi. Hi, I'm Lexi from Phoenix, Arizona. My daughter Harper is almost three years old and she has Turner syndrome and she's also born at 30 weeks. She is missing her full second X chromosome and with her syndrome along with her prematurity, it causes um, feeding issues and she uses a G-tube for nutrition. She has a significant speech delay, abnormalities in development with her reproductive organs. She has a webbed neck and a requirement of growth hormones for short stature. She also requires just a lot of monitoring for future issues, but that is all she has at the moment. So one of my favorite cute and quirky things about Harper is the way that she runs. It's really more of a prance and she prances around with joy and light everywhere she goes. She literally never walks. She runs everywhere and Usually when she's running, she is laughing. And I just like picture this sparkly rainbow following behind her. It just, it's seriously magical. And everybody really loves it about her. And then another thing that is just so cute about my Harper is her love of books. She always has a book in her hands and she loves to flip through them and It's so cute. The way she flips through them, she just does it super fast. And then she like hyper focuses on one page and finds the littlest details that she loves. So she'll just find one little butterfly. She's obsessed with airplanes and soccer balls and just a bunch of random things that she just loves to look through all of her books for. And I don't know, it just, it's really sweet. And my all-time favorite cute and quirky thing about Harper is how she cuddles her sister. So Harper is not the snuggly type at all. We always joke that she doesn't sit still long enough to cuddle someone. And she has recently started being really affectionate with her baby sister, who is about a year old. And Harper calls her (laughs) my baby. And she cuddles her in just a very specific way. So Anna will be crawling around on the ground and Harper goes up to her and she puts her head right on her chest and she just stays there. And like I said, Harper is never still. So she just stays there and, you know, Anna's a baby. So she'll, you know, grab her hair and start kind of like drumming on her face. And Harper just loves it. She giggles and laughs and she just truly loves that physical touch from her sister and it, it's truly just the sweetest thing and she doesn't do it with anyone else so it melts my heart. And then what I have gained from the parent experience. So when we found out there was something wrong in utero with Harper, uh, our MFM mentioned to us that it could be from a chromosomal defect 
uh, and that our child very likely may have special needs. And I remember in that moment praying to God, just saying, no, like, no, I am not a special needs mom. Like those are special moms. Those are moms who are really, really patient and have sweet, soft voices and always have the right thing to say and can handle anything. And I remember just thinking, that is not me. And I was just so convinced I could never be that mom. And when we received her diagnosis, my heart just slightly began to soften to the idea of it. We really began to accept kind of the cards we were dealt. And over the next two and a half months that I was still pregnant before we had her, my heart just began to soften even more and just kind of realizing that, you know, okay, this is something I might be okay at, but I was still really, really nervous. And the day that she was born, I just remember thinking that God blessed me with a gift and that this was not an accident or mistake. I was chosen to have the honor of being her mother and I to this day could never thank God enough for choosing me. And after our long NICU stay, I began to quickly see all of the delays, the speech, fine motor, gross motor, physical, and it was honestly all consuming. I spent the last three years putting my nose to the grindstone to catch her up. My eyes were set on milestones and I realized after three years that I was missing the point. Life is not about meeting the milestones on time or doing things in perfect order. She will get to where she's going in her own time and life as her mother isn't about fixing her because she is already perfect. Raising my rare girl is about creating a meaningful life based on her strengths. It's about meeting her where she's at and loving her through and through. And that is something that's taken a lot of time and it's taken a lot of soul searching to realize I was chasing the idea of what I thought having our daughter was going to be like and not just accepting her the way she is and seeing the absolute beauty that comes in that. I feel like I started to miss the beauty in her quirks and her differences. And even though, yeah, she has quite a bit of delays, sometimes that's incredible because what I am realizing with having a second daughter who is developing more typically is that Harper gets to stay in some of her stages a little bit longer. And that is an incredible thing because kids grow up so fast and in the blink of an eye, you know, one milestone is over. And with Harper, we get to spend a little extra time in each space. And I'm at a place now where I'm absolutely cherishing that. And I'm I'm just thankful. And yeah, that is uh, what I've gained from parenting Harper so far. There's so much I could go into, but uh, that is my biggest life lesson at the moment. And yeah, she's incredible. And I am so thankful to be her mama. Lexi, these are words that I think every new parent especially needs to hear and that we all need as a really good reminder. Uh, I think there is a huge pressure on us to, you know, get our kids to these milestones as quickly as possible. And I think that pressure really can be super suffocating and I just think it's really profound to get to the place where you can really accept your child exactly as they are and to recognize that it's not our job to fix them. Like, yes, we want our children to reach their full potential, but I think the realization you had that, you know, every person's full potential is going to be different than the next person's and just realizing that and accepting that I think is really profound. And I think we really do 
miss out on a lot of joyous moments just in everyday living when we're so fixated on getting our kids to the next milestone. So thank you so much for sharing your insights, Lexi. All right, next we have Roya. Hi, my name is Roya and I'm from Half Moon Bay, California. I am mom to three awesome kids and I'm a caregiver to my daughter, Shadi, who's five years old. Shadi was born with a rare genetic condition called Shafiang syndrome. Shadi is nonverbal, non-mobile, tube fed, and does have an autism diagnosis, but that definitely doesn't stop her from developing the greatest personality. We call her our princess warrior because she's so strong and resilient, yet super sweet and gentle. She loves to play with people's hair and knows when to stop. <laughs> Considering all she goes through, she's got the best attitude. She's my biggest inspiration, right ahead of my boys. I love being a mom, but I have struggles of my own which make my job harder. When I was 18, I was diagnosed with depression and generalized anxiety disorder. I struggled a lot in college, but I managed to get by by seeing the school counselor regularly. But I experienced difficult postpartum depression after my first baby, and I worked with mental health professionals at the hospital and was prescribed medication and eventually felt pretty stable. Then Shadi was born in 2016. We had no idea there was any issues during the pregnancy, so it was a major shock that she was born with complications. I quit my job to take care of my daughter and we started going to multiple ongoing therapies, building a list of specialists to see so many different tests and sleep studies. I also had to figure out how to advocate and honestly I didn't even really know what that word meant at the time. There was insurance issues and equipment we needed and early intervention and the worst of it all was seeing my baby struggle. I was overwhelmed by the amount of care involved and the pressure to do it all right, and my mental health just declined so quickly. I did not cope well at first. I isolated a lot. I didn't reach out to any family or friends like you're supposed to, um, but I was just so, so depressed. I struggled to eat and take care of myself, but all I did was focus my energy on was on my kids. I just couldn't enjoy a single minute of it, and I felt like I was drowning. I remember exactly when my rock bottom was, though. I was crying in the car after a doctor's appointment into a pile of paperwork, and I was feeling so over it. I didn't know how else to describe it. I was so over it. But I realized that if I wasn't going to do it, I would have to leave my daughter at the hands of someone else, and I couldn't bear that fact. It was kind of a light switch moment that drove me to reach out and get help and admit that I couldn't do it alone. I'm three years into seeing a psychologist and a psychiatrist regularly who I vibe well with, and it's been a hard but gratifying journey for sure. There are so many things that I've learned during therapy, but some of the best advice was the hardest to swallow. One of the first things my therapist had me do was to accept my situation this was the hardest, but I think it was the most important because it allowed me to recognize and actually face my problem and move forward with peace instead of anger. Another thing I think was really <laughs> important for me was to learn that rest is required, not earned. I think a lot of us grow up thinking the opposite, but in terms of self-care, it's been a game changer. I had to learn to reprioritize myself and put me at the top. So when I felt tired, I closed my computer and watched some TV with my kids. When I felt overwhelmed, I went to the beach and sat by the ocean for an hour. When I felt like I couldn't keep up with her therapies, we switched to one or two therapies at a time instead of all five. And the guilt faded when I realized that when I take those necessary breaks, I come home a happier and well-rested mom and a more motivated caregiver. Another skill I learned was to just be present. And I feel like it sounds silly and probably the easiest, but it was actually pretty hard. I always have swirling thoughts, remembering past traumas, fearing the future, worrying about finances, etc. But if you find tools to center yourself and be present, everything else fades away. For me, this was easy. When I start feeling overwhelmed by these thoughts, I take deep breaths and I just go sit with shoddy and play. It's really fun. All these skills took a really long time to learn but I'm glad that I kept with it because it really does pay off. 
I think having a medically complex child can be very stressful and the grief can feel really cyclical. So I think it's important to learn some of these skills so that you're not being crushed by yourself (laughs) or that you're not fighting yourself. You're not getting in your own way. I know that applying these skills has definitely made me a stronger mom, a better advocate, so I can spend my energy focusing on Shadi and making sure she gets everything she needs. Sometimes I think it's a little funny that having Shadi in my life led me to learn to advocate for myself. And advocating for myself, in turn, leads me to advocate better for her. And Shadi has experienced so much. She deserves a good life and a good future. And I know now that I can give that to her. It feels good to know that everything she's been through, everything I've gone through as her mom, has been a learning experience for us. I am a much more confident mom, a much more confident advocate, and it feels good to give myself the grace to make mistakes and take breaks without the guilt. Reaching out for help made me more aware of the mental health struggles we all face, especially in our unique community of rare parents and caregivers. Most of us haven't asked to be in this position, but we love our kids and will do anything for them. Before, I would do anything to see Shadi smile, but now I can also enjoy it. Roya, I so appreciate your contribution. I think your vulnerability in sharing you know, your rock bottom and how tough things were emotionally for you is really brave. And I know there are a lot of parents that really can relate with what you've experienced. And, you know, therapy, like I think there's a lot to be said for therapy and how much it has helped you in the past and is currently helping you. And I've been a huge benefactor of therapy. And, you know, I think a lot of these experiences can hit really hard. And especially if we are already predisposed to mental health issues. And so I really applaud that you were able to get help and that your experiences with your daughter really did help you learn to advocate for yourself as well. I just think your experience is really beautiful to hear. I know it probably didn't feel beautiful in the moment and may not even seem like it to you, but thank you so much for sharing with such vulnerability. All right, now we get to hear from Anna Lee. Hi, I'm Annalie Navarro from Atlanta, Georgia. My daughter Julia is four and a half years old and was born with biliary atresia. Biliary atresia is a rare liver disease that is the main cause of liver transplantation in children in the U.S. And I had the most amazing, amazing, amazing opportunity to be her living donor. Julia is now four and a half and she is smart and strong and kind and very creative. She loves horseback riding and reading and dancing and she wants to be a scientist and a doctor and an author and also a painter when she grows up. And I'm sure school is going to be quite pricey so we've already started saving for her. I, as many of you are, am a rare disease mom and a transplant mom and also a living organ donor. And all of these are equally important to me because they have changed me in the best way possible. When she was initially diagnosed, I quickly found myself navigating this rare disease world with so many unknowns. But I also found myself being part of this new rare disease community and of this liver family that just welcomed us and it definitely made our journey so much better. I know that a rare disease diagnosis can be challenging and hard and so very scary at times, especially at the beginning. It's overwhelming having to learn so much information and maintain your sanity and still be a powerhouse of hope and positive energy for your child, but it can definitely be done. Never, I think that never ever in a lifetime, I would have imagined that we would have find myself going through everything that we did. I think that as new parents, we have this perfect movie envisioned and we see ourselves having a healthy, beautiful and strong baby. My baby was 
beautiful and incredibly strong. And thanks to her amazing team of doctors, now she's healthy and thriving too. Our journey was a difficult one. And it was full of challenges, but also a beautiful one. And I have embraced their experience. I think that for Julia, having lived all of this at such a young age, talking to her about her story and transplant journey has always been very important to me. I want her to be empowered by her journey and to own her story with pride and grace. Being a parent to a child with a complex medical history in our case, biliary atresia and a liver transplant can be very challenging as they grow up. And I mean, it's hard at any age, but especially when they're this little. So this is how my book, Mighty Me, was born. I realized that there were no books that she could identify with and see herself in. There were no books about organ transplants that would open this very important dialogue with her in a child-friendly way. So I decided to write one and not just for her, but for a community as well. These are formative years, and although she's only four, conversations like these are very important and very much needed, not only with her own children, but also with their friends and their classmates as well. And so the more I thought about it, the more I became passionate, and I decided to make it my mission and make it happen. I wanted other children with transplants and complex medical conditions to see themselves as heroes of their own stories. I want them to be empowered by their journeys and be proud of how brave and strong they are. I don't want them growing up, especially not her, resenting their journey and thinking of their story as something sad or negative that they had to go through. I want Julia and any other transplant child like her to be able to speak about their stories with their friends and classmates with confidence and pride and purpose. Having a purpose in life is so important and it gives you that much power and it gives you that much confidence which is needed for you to be successful in life and to be an advocate for whatever it is that you are passionate about. And I hope that through our story and our book, we can help educate other children about transplants and organ donation and also rare diseases. Mighty Me is about my mighty Julia in our transplant story. I think there is beauty in everything and I want her to see things the same way too. And I've learned to find the beauty in everything, even in the most difficult of times. I have also learned that advocacy can look very different for everyone and we shouldn't limit ourselves. There are many gaps that need to be filled within our own communities. And honestly, there is no one that knows that better than we do. So what does your community need? What does your child need? What is something that you would love for your child to have or for other children to have to be able to feel that empowerment and that pride in their journey and also be a way to educate others and make your child's journey easier. So let's allow our journeys, as hard as they might be, to give us purpose and find a new calling to serve our communities and find creative ways to advocate for our children and others like them. My life with Julia is beautiful and I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's been the joy of my life to give life to her twice. And thanks to our experience, I've become a better person, mother, and now an advocate for organ donation and a children's book author. It's been quite a journey for us. It's been beautiful and rough and uh, wouldn't change it for the world. It's been an amazing journey. So I hope that you are able to also find the beauty in your journey and a purpose that comes with it. Wow, Annalie, I love the power in this. I love how empowered you are in creating this children's book and in becoming an advocate. And I love that you were motivated to create that children's book to empower your daughter. And I also love your desire to empower each of us as parents uh, to find our own passion and our own ways of improving the world in our, our own space. And I think your passion is really contagious. Um, I hope each of us listening can think of just one way, tiny or huge or somewhere in between, um, to make a positive difference in our spaces. And it doesn't have to be momentous. It's not an all or nothing type of situation. 
Like even things like smiling at other parents when you're at a clinic's office, like as cheesy as that sounds, it really does make a difference instead of just keeping your eyes on the floor and, you know, hustling through. Um, You know, as parents, we need each other. And just that little bit of encouragement and warmth, just making eye contact with another parent, I think can be really powerful. Just food for thought. Um, Also, for those interested, there is a link in the show notes so you can check out Annalie's book, Mighty Me. She actually gifted us a copy of it, and it really is gorgeous. It's just full of magic and symbolism, and I thought it was really fun to read with my kids. All right, next we have Heather. Hi, I'm Heather, a Kiwi living in Sydney, Australia, and my daughter Ariana is nearly six years old and has Soto syndrome the rare disease affecting 1 in 14,000. She wasn't diagnosed till she was nearly two, but she had many common issues from Soto syndrome, low tone, low blood sugars at birth, and infantile scoliosis, which required bracing um, and still does now at night. And she has sensory processing disorders, very movement seeking. She's a great kid. Uh, She's really sweet and loving. She's always asking me for cuddles. Uh, She's very creative. She spends her days drawing. She loves constructing things out of the furniture around our house and pillows and her toys and various different things. And she loves pretend play, which is really fun. I love that she surprises everyone once they get to know her and how capable she is. Uh, She's an amazing swimmer. She's really quite good at drawing. She watches and learns from others um, and she's just come so far from the baby she was to the child she is today. She's on track to start mainstream school actually next month. Uh, So I'm really proud of her and how far she's come. Having a child with a rare condition, a disability, it's changed me profoundly. And I'm sure that many parents will attest to that with their children too. Uh, Before Ariana, I had really no experience or exposure with people with disabilities. Um, I was brought up in a different world where disability was somewhat hidden. All the narratives around disability were just how tragic and awful it was. It was seen as a less than experience to have a disability or to be the mum of a child with a disability, a worst case nightmare scenario almost. So when I had a child with a disability, that was the narrative that I had in my mind. Um, It actually took having a child with a rare condition to see how wrong that narrative really was. Uh, It's just so much more complex and deep than anyone can imagine. There are challenges, but it's full of perspectives and gifts along the way. If you're open to see them, it's really is a true roller coaster ride. And seeing my daughter grow and achieve simple things like, you know, she was tube fed as a baby, nailed by mouth. She was actually pump fed at one point. And just seeing her eat an ice cream today without choking or ride a scooter, you know, she didn't walk till she was nearly two. They feel like watching miracles unfold sometimes. And I'm just so much more aware of how much luck plays into all our abilities and and the value in the journey and not just the destination. Yeah, it really changes you. I've also met other rare mums and, you know, I learned so much about the power of talking to people with lived experience and learning from them. I've talked to so many parents about what it's like raising a child with Soto syndrome and I've spoken to so many people with neurodiversities and adults with Soto syndrome and their experience and learning from them has been invaluable and and really changed my perspective on things. Reading the special book by Melanie Dimmitt was a real game changer for me and shifting my perspective. She writes so brilliantly interviewing other parents who've raised children with disability who are further along the journey than me about dealing with comparisons and other challenging things. I did an excellent program called Now and Next through an organization, Plumtree, that was local to me. Um, And that taught me how to set goals for my child and my family, focus on Ariana's strengths and be empowered as the parent. That the therapists were there for me and my child to help upskill her, but also upskill me and what she needs so that I can take that knowledge to other areas of her life, like daycare, playgrounds, to get more out of the session than just the hour working with her. I realized the importance role I played as her advocate in the world and 
to ensure that she has access to a full life and is treated as an equal. You know, I've become a real advocate for other families as well, and I've supported other families through volunteering as part of the Soto Syndrome Association of Australasia. I've grown in my knowledge and perspective and understanding of what matters in empathy. Having a child with a rare disease teaches you that, you know, one in 14,000, one in a million, one in 50,000, that that can be any of us and how not rare collectively rare diseases really are. I think most countries will say, you know, 20% of their population have some level of a, a disability or some type of a disability. And we all can have challenges in life. And, you know, not many of us get a free pass through life without any major challenges, even the celebrities. <laughs> but we can make the cards work for us. And, you know, the journey continues for us as she starts school next year. But most days now, you know, most of the time I just feel lucky. You know, we spent the first year with my daughter in and out of hospital and to see where she is today, it's just, we're just so lucky. And, you know, I just, I've learned so much through raising Ariana. And of course I have my worries for my daughter, you know, all the time. And I also worry about my other typical daughter. You know, I think all parents can relate to that. But these days, my worries for Ariana are more about things like ableism and being excluded. You know, I want her to feel valued as she deserves to be, but not about, you know, who she is. I know that she's a beautiful, capable girl as her sister is. You know, I just want the world to have space for her and all unique children. And, you know, I'm just so blessed to have learned all I have from her. Thank you. Heather, thank you so much for sharing that. I love all the growth and transformation that you were able to feel with your daughter. And I also love that you brought up the ingrained, you know, ableism or um, prejudice that you felt about people who are disabled. Like, I think that most of us have that going into, um, you know, having a child with disabilities and I think that really shapes a lot of our, especially earlier experiences with it. And so I really appreciate your um, honesty in talking about that because I think it's really important to recognize the misconceptions we have about disability while, you know, going into it as new parents. Yeah, what a beautiful tribute to the things you've learned and the love you have for your daughter just shines through so brightly. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, last but not least... We have Rayelle. Hi there, I'm Rayelle from Grand Prairie, Alberta, Canada. My son Arden is 20 months old and has Escobar syndrome. In Arden's case, he now relies on a tracheostomy and ventilator for his breathing needs. Of course, as a mom, I think that my kid is the cutest and three of my favorite cute things about Arden is one, he is so incredibly nosy. <laughs> he wants to know everything that is happening around him. And because of this, he's such a quick learner. He can learn a new ASL sign in a day or two because he just wants so badly to be able to tell everyone what he wants. The second one is Arden loves the Edmonton Oilers, so the NHL hockey team. He has an Edmonton Oilers pillow that his cousin made for him, and it has to come everywhere with him. He also claps and waves his hands in the air when he sees or hears hockey on TV. He absolutely loves it. And the third thing is Arden loves showing off. He knows all the parts of his body and if you ask him where's your nose or where's your toes stuff like that he happily points and shows off what he knows because he just wants to show everybody how smart he is. <laughs> so with my journey as a medical mom, I think that it really changed who I was as a person at my core, especially from a mental and emotional standpoint. For as long as I can remember, I've suffered from depression and anxiety. The depression comes and goes. It's largely influenced by stressful periods of my life, but anxiety is something that has definitely plagued me for a very long time and has definitely impacted the types of opportunities and challenges that I have been able to push myself to take on. Although I do often feel a sense of confidence in myself as a person, a teacher, a mom, etc., my anxiety often tells me that I'm not good enough. And this can be especially difficult in social situations where I'm constantly second-guessing everything that I say or wondering how my words will be received by other people. 
Having Arden completely changed my life. I mean, of course, I knew that being a mother would change me, but I never really expected some of the mental and emotional changes that I felt taking place as Arden grew and as I grew into my unique role as his mom. My husband and I have always been a team, and when Arden was born, I really felt like a lesser part of that team. I felt unsure being the person who does not have a medical background. Um, my husband's a physical therapist. He's worked in a hospital setting. He has advanced knowledge of the human body. I, however, had no medical knowledge prior to Arden's birth. Everything was new and terrifying to me. And let me tell you, nothing prepares you to see your brand new baby intubated, ventilated, with five or six IV lines attached to them, nitric oxide being used to keep their lungs open, etc. I definitely leaned on Brody, my husband, during those first weeks. I really felt so timid and I was grieving what we had imagined for our birth story, what we had imagined for bringing our baby home. However, when Arden was only a few weeks old, he and I had to stay in the city while he was still in hospital. Brody had to return home, so for us that's over five hours away from the city, uh, during the weekdays for work. He would only be able to return on the weekends to spend two, sometimes three days with us and then return home again for work. So I can honestly pinpoint the exact moment when I became a completely different person because it happened as I watched Brody driving away to go back to work. In that moment, I really just decided that the only person getting me through our experience would be me. I knew that I had to be strong and that the coping mechanisms that I had held onto in the past just wouldn't work. It was as if I somehow knew that my anxiety wouldn't serve me in any positive way, and that if I broke down emotionally, I wouldn't be able to be the mom that I knew I needed to be for Arden. So during the seven and a half months that Arden spent in the hospital, I spent every waking moment by his bedside. I was learning about ventilator pressures, blood gas numbers, suctioning, pick lines, medications, all that jazz. I honestly took detailed notes like a madwoman every single day until I was confident that I could advocate in Arden's best interest. Rounds at the hospital in the ICU occurred every morning and night uh, with up to 10 doctors and other medical professionals present at each round. So honestly, before Arden was born, I, I was a much more meek person. In my personal life with family and friends, I've always been able to express myself well enough. But at my work as a teacher, I often, I often struggled to speak up during staff meetings and planning periods with other educators uh, because I did not feel the confidence to do so. However, like when meetings started involving my son, I found that I could speak up in a room filled with ICU doctors without a shred of self-doubt. I talked a bit with a therapist while Arden was in the hospital, and after quite a few sessions, I admitted that I had previously suffered with severe anxiety. Shockingly, in one session, she remarked that she had never guessed that I was an anxious person. I knew at that point that a huge change had occurred to me. I had definitely hidden my anxiety in other settings before, uh, work for example. I realized when speaking to the therapist that I wasn't hiding my anxiety. It just didn't exist in my world as a medical mom. Now that we're at home, I definitely have anxious feelings that come up for various reasons. Um, usually I get a little bit anxious and on edge when we have to travel for Arden's appointments, and I definitely feel my anxiety in my body each time he has another surgery. I still hate making appointment phone calls for myself. That's another part of my social anxiety. <laughs> That's always been a source of stress for me, but now the state of my mental health rarely becomes debilitating for me. I've learned to allow feelings of self-doubt, worry, grief, trauma, to pass through, I can accept that those feelings are going to be a part of my life without letting them consume all of my energy. I now have the ability to push through so that I can be the best version of myself for me and our family. I love your story, Rael. I think it's so interesting that being pushed beyond your limits to that degree with your child at the hospital, you know, being without your husband, that that was kind of your moment of transformation and of really growing into that new role as medical mom and you know I think it's really incredible what we can manage to do and push ourselves um, past so many limits that we have on ourselves you know when it's for someone like our child that we love so so much and so unconditionally all right a huge thank you to each parent that contributed to this special rare disease day episode it would not be possible without you 
You can find links in the show notes to follow each of these lovely parents on Instagram. And you can also find links to the two books that were mentioned in the episode. Be sure to join our Facebook group, Parents of Children with Rare Conditions. It's a really supportive community of parents who get it. There is a link for that as well. Join me next week for my conversation with Amanda Griffith Atkins, a licensed therapist and rare mama, to talk about health anxiety and how it affects probably every single one of us. It's a powerful episode and you do not want to miss it. See you then.